All right, we're gonna start part two, and this is the uh, circuit, just right here. I was gonna use on this breadboard, but this little breadboard's damaged and it doesn't work. Um, sometimes you get these little cheap ones from China, and some of the pins are broke or shorted. That's the problem with this one. Uh, but I used a big, semi-professional breadboard. I have bigger, um, and I made a lighting circuit. Uh, I've been testing it. I used, um, and I'll go over all the pieces, but there is a timing chip with some components, and I have eight yellow lights to represent the eight yellow lights that go in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So, uh, what those are is the ones that go around the edges and then up inside the octopus head. Uh, it was easier than using those wires, plus not all those LEDs on that cap or top are functional. So, here's eight lights. Now, I told you in part one, we were looking at maybe running a five volt power supply uh, to run the timing circuit for this piece, for that little board right there. Uh, we're not. We are, but we're not. I'm gonna run a 12 volt power supply because this timing circuit needs 12 volts. And you're like, oh, but this can't do 12 volts. The motors will spin too fast and burn up because they're only ready for six. Don't worry, we'll go over that probably in part three when we finish the project on how to have 12 volts come in and then break up the voltages to the different components. Um, so I went through and I cordoned off all the wires with the same color, so dark green and black, uh, these are the light green and white. These are the medium green and grays. Anyhow, there are a total of seven bundles, if I remember right. One, two, three, four, five, six bundles. Because the one that's missing from here, because you might only see five pieces of tape, is the two wires that go to the octopus head over there. So, six bundles. Now I watched a couple of videos on the octo swing light pattern. And uh, basically the lights just go like outer couple, outer couple, inner barrel. The octopus head is completely separate. So I could build six lighting circuits, which would be obnoxious. I'd have to make six sets of those. Um, or I could double them up meaning that one lighting circuit does, let's say, the green and the purple with the gray. So that means they'll come on at the same time, and then I only need three lighting circuits. Uh, and you can either, we can either put them on a breadboard, like so, or I can uh, solder them together like this. A little cleaner when I actually do a, a one for in here. This was just to test the uh, components. But I can do something like this, a little smaller because I won't need these long leads, and just hot glue these to the base. So I'll see when we get to that point. So there are there are options depending on size. If you can't make a circuit board or breadboard work because of space or height requirements or something, you can just solder the components to themselves and then make sure that nothing touches them because these are all bare leads. So you don't want them to arc or short out and then you can just hot glue them to the bottom of your piece or top if it's housed in the top section versus the bottom. Anyhow, let me uh, turn this on and turn off the light so you can see these lights do their thing. So I'm gonna turn it on. The lights came on, let's kill the light. You see how they're pulsing. I'm sure they're pulsing a slightly faster than the original. I can slow them down, but in doing so, um, it, I, don't, I don't see much of the effect. Uh, and how you slow it down is you just change the capacitor, because I've gone through about four or five trying to adjust the speed, and this speed to me is probably the best speed. Um, these are the amber, orange, yellow, or more amber than yellow. Um, or orange, some call them, that matches what's up in this, up in the octopus head and arms. And then the ones in here are greens and purples, I believe. 
but of course I'm not here in this space. Um, but this shows you proof of concept. Now we just need to take this proof of concept, make it slightly smaller if possible, or make it on a more stable platform because I'm not screwing this in there. I do have plenty of breadboards. I mean, they're cheap. You can buy them anywhere. Here's one that's not attached to the metal. It's got double back tape on it. I could technically put all three in there and it'll probably fit perfectly in here as well. And if uh, I can line it up, I might even be able to make some of these standoffs line up with a couple screw holes. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see what we're going to do uh, once we get to that point. But at the moment, I wanted to show you proof of concept of making a lighting circuit that pulsates. Um, you can make it faster so it's almost blinking or strobing. You can make it slower so it's really slow. So it's just a fade in and a fade out. And we're talking over seconds, not one second or two seconds like this. So we have choices. So I could even make the octopus slower because in the videos that I've looked online, it looks like the octopus is a slower transition rate than the body, or I can make it faster. The only difference between this circuit and the circuit that was in the house or piece originally is when it turns the greens and purples off that are in the, the base and the shaft, they turn off completely. And that circuit, I can build that one too. Bigger chip, more expensive chip, more components attached to it, and I'd only maybe be able to fit two of them on this breadboard. Um, but if you just have them go dim, which the camera is picking it up is a lot brighter than what it really is. When these go dim, they're dim, and then they come back on. Um, these have a forward voltage of 1.7 to 2.2. This circuit is dropping the power 1.8 to 2.1. So it's a 0 0.3 volt variance. I can change the resistor, which would make them dimmer or brighter, whichever is better. But I'm within the range of these amber LEDs. Again, below 1.7, it's just a little dot. You can't see it. Above 2.1, it starts changing from amber to a deep orange. And that's because you're overdriving it and they're going to burn out. So or 2.3. Sorry, I think I said 2.1. 2.3. So if I run my 2.5 volts, they will physically start to burn out. Their lifespan would be shortened dramatically. If I run them below 1.6, 1.7, you're not going to see them. So this 1.8 to 2.1, 0.3 volt uh, up and down from bright to dim is within the range of the LED to give it the longest lifespan because we're not driving it at maximum and we're not driving it at minimum. Uh, an analogy would be your car. If you constantly ran the engine, let's say it's a 6,000 RPM engine, you constantly ran it at 4,000 RPM, you're going to wear it out a lot faster than if you run it at you know, 3,000 RPM. Uh, we're talking like on a highway, straight power, not going back and forth. And same thing, if you're driving at a low RPM, it's going to gum up the motor as well. So having it in the middle we'll get a good longevity and we won't lose all the color so the piece will not go completely dark which i noticed in the videos and it could be just the cameras that were filming it because a lot of these picture films were filmed many years ago we're talking six years ago or plus and camera technology has gotten well better except my camera which intermittently changes what it wants to do it may be darker on camera than it actually is in person because it cannot pick up the light as efficiently that's another thing. Most of the videos are literally a half a decade or older. It's an old piece. I'm going to turn on the light again. I'm going to turn on the other light, too. There we go. All right. So we now have a proof of concept. Now the question is, is do we want to separate them into six or three or four? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send power to each of these and figure out what colors they are. I know it's like greens and purples. Uh, the reason I want to do that is the green LEDs will have a different forward voltage and a purple LED, which has a different forward voltage than a yellow LED. And if you put a green and a purple on the same chip, the greens won't turn on. Or uh, in that case of green and purple, the purples won't turn on because they take higher voltage to turn them on. They have a higher forward voltage. 
the electricity is going to try and take the least path of resistance, which would be the greens, which have a lower forward voltage. They'll run at 1.5, 1.4, and the purples won't run until they hit 2, as an example. Um, so we want to make sure we try and balance the loads. You can balance them with resistors and compensate, but that's more work. It might be easier just to build an extra timing circuit for the lights and have an extra one because there is plenty of space in here, especially since we're not going to have a speaker. You could even dremel out this dome and then use these two screw holes to screw something on, such as the breadboard. So, um, I went through some switches, and this is the nicest one. And it's an on, off. It won't fit in this hole. You have to drill the hole out, but it threads in, and then you can put a dab of hot glue on it, like they do here, to you know make it in, and it's nice and clean. I have some smaller ones that are toggles, which would look stupid, and I have some smaller ones that are push on, push off. But again, they don't have any way to attach to the unit, so you rely only on the glue, which I don't want to do. Um, the only issue I might encounter is that the hole is right here and that's right here if you notice how fat that is it might interfere with this standoff which means that i might use the edge of the hole and make a new hole just off center so it's like that so it clears that so these studs can fit right there so i have been going through different things to find the best way to make this the cleanest also the black on black, meaning the button's black and the bezel's black, will match the black face for the plug-in. So it won't stand out. Because some of the other switches I have are red or maroon and black, and well, there's nothing maroon or red on this piece. I'm not counting the wire I soldered in. Um, so I do have a thicker wire, I think I mentioned that in part one, to help with the extra power, because we're not going to be running the four and a half volts, we're going to be running a 12 volt, and then we're going to be stepping that down to 5 volts. This circuit board will run on 12 volts. So I'm going to have the power come in to this at 12 volts, but the motor power will be the 5 volt. And that way the motor spin at 5 volts, because that's what the timing is set for on this piece over here. You know, we're going to try and make this close to OEM as possible. Can't do it 100%, but we're going to do our best. But we're going to make it functional. We're going to make the lights pulsate. We're going to make the motor spin. We're going to make it go in and out. We just won't have the auto turn off or the sound. And of course, the pattern of lights and the arc won't be the same. But I like it with the arc going out further. Uh, that's my personal thing. I just like to see the arms use the entire range versus the third that the, is from the factory. So I'm going to clean some of this up. We're going to set it up and then we're going to build a circuit together. We'll go over all the components. I'll list the components below as well. But I'll tell you right off the get-go, for this speed that it's at right now, you need an NE 555 timing chip, which is right here. These two small guys right there, these are bigger timing circuits. They're more logic chips, and um, these will do the off, and then on, and then off, and then on, uh, on the Pulsate. You can see there's more pins, so it has more options. Uh, you'll need, and this is more of the small those. Uh, you'll need a 680 ohm resistor, approximately. You can make it a little less if you want the light a little brighter, or a little higher if you want the light a little dimmer. Uh, resistors, which I just poured out, you need uh, 33 uh, K ohm resistors, or kilo ohm, and then these are the 680s. Uh, you'll need a co the capacitor that I have in here is a 16 volt 100 uh, microfarad. If you want them to pulsate quicker, you can use a 47 microfarad. You can use a 25 volt, which won't change the speed. That just increases the 12 to 16 is only 25% over. But if you put a 25 in there, that's a um, more than 100% buffer. You never want to run components at their max power. That's what I was mentioning about the LEDs. I don't want to keep running these things at 2.3 volts or 2.2 volts constantly because their lifespan will be shorter because you're running them at max power. Same with capacitor. You don't want to run those things if they're rated for 20 volts. Don't run them at 20 volts all the time. Put in a 30 volt or a 40 volt. That way you have a buffer. Keep them cooler. They don't get as hot or explode because this is the style that explodes. 
uh, one of the previous videos I did with um, one of the ships, as well as one of the other pieces, the capacitors exploded. And they will, even if they're underpowered, because they dry out. They're full of liquid. Uh, and then you need some jumper wires. And then you need a BC547 transistor, which, where did I put the... Right there. And I'll put links below where you can buy these. This is a, I don't know, 10 pack, 20 pack that I got off Amazon because I can't find mine. I have like a hundred of these, but I'm starting to pack up stuff for moving the bench. I have no idea where they go. Just like I didn't have enough capacitors, so I bought a multi-kit as well. And then you can see this is what I'm running in here right now. I am running the 100 microfarad 16 volt. But if I wanted to go faster, I would run the 47 25 volt because this is a 12 volt power. If I run the 10, I'll blow the capacitor up. So you gotta watch your voltage as well as um, what you want. If I put in a 220, it pulsates really slow. And if I do a 1000, it doesn't even pulsate. It's just too high. If I do a 0.1 microfarad as an example, it's, it tries the strobe, but it's so quick that you can't hardly see it. It just basically looks like the light's dim. So you can change the speeds by changing the capacitor and by changing this blue resistor here. Now the color of the resistor, they come in tans, blues, blacks, browns. That's not what we care about. We care about the bands on it. So I don't know if it'll show it in this light, but you can see the different colored bands. And then since this spilled, let's grab a bigger one. And you can see those. This is all orange, 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 orange. And that's where we're at. So I'm going to pause it, get everything set up, and show you how to build a circuit. And then I'm going to pop all of these in there, being this, and redo the wiring. Uh, because a couple of these are burned out. Which makes it not work so good. <laughs> so. But hopefully... This gives you an idea on how to do stuff to fix your um, house or carnival style pieces to make them somewhat functional when they do fail. Like I said, this will be a more in-depth series of videos, more technical. Uh, it does require more tools, uh, magnifier, soldering, uh, heat shrink, uh, heat gun, or a lighter if you want to go cheap. Components that you probably don't have laying around. They're not expensive, but... You know, most people don't have laying around unless you're building stuff like this. Um, so, but anyhow, I'm going to clean some of this junk up, get uh, some of the components out of here and here and here, and get it ready to build more circuits so we can tie them into that piece and make sure that all these lights do what they're supposed to do. I will test these lights separately from a circuit to make sure they actually turn on and don't have a bad one, because this has bad ones. There's like three of them in here that don't work. And uh, you probably can't see it. But the inside is supposed to be clear, clear, and there's a black spot. I don't know if you can see it right there, right in the center. It's burned out. Yeah. Causes a problem because it's not a balanced load anymore. So, But I shall return in just a moment. So one moment, please. Okay, we are back to continue on the lighting part. Um, we're going to go into the circuitry uh, for the pulsating lights, which the purple will be pulsating. And I got another itty bitty board and made one circuit. I'm going to make another one and show you how to do it, um, which I'll just put right here on this end of the board. But the green lights that are in the base and bottom piece here that points down, Instead of making them pulsate, because every time I do, uh, it, it seems to blow an LED. One or two of the LEDs fries, and I'm not sure why. I've built this circuit many a times. I actually have this circuit in my own display. And the LEDs have been working for many, many years. So, either the chips I got have an issue, because the chips I used in my, my display are from the 90s, not the current iteration of the 2020s. Or, the LEDs, same thing. The LEDs I am using 
more recent, whereas the LEDs on my display are also from the 90s. So, I'm not sure. But I am using larger LEDs on my display, but the forward voltage and the amperage are the same. So. Anyhow, uh, so, to make the green lights flash, I don't know if you can see them. Right there, there's one. Let me turn off this light. There you go. And you see the green lights are flashing. You can see that one's flashing and that one's flashing because those are the ones that point down. This is a very, very simple way to make your lights flash. Um, I had a friend who did this all the time. He didn't want to build circuits or find millions of different lights to make different lighting patterns for the little arts and craft projects he did that he made light up. So this one's very simple. You might notice that at the bottom of your screen, there's a dull white flash. That's not the reflection of the green LED. As you can see, the green LED here has almost no light uh, reflecting upwards. Here, make it a little easier. There we go. To make this to where you can have flashing lights, all you need to do is buy a flashing LED. Right there. I made a little cap for it. And wire it in series. And bam, everything that's in the same circuit will start to flash. So the flashing LED pattern actually doesn't look too bad. Let me cover this white light up so it stops swapping out the camera. There we go. And with the pulsating purples and the flickering yellows, it actually doesn't look too horrible. I've kind of just laid everything next to each other to test it out. So I'm going to turn the lights back on. Here they come. Click. And click. So let me show you how this is done. This will be very easy for you. Some people I've known who've done this by accident, which means that they put a flashing LED in the circuit and all the lights after the circuit flash just because the flashing LED interrupts the circuit, meaning it's on, off, on, off. It's like flipping a light switch to make all your lights in your house go on, off. That's what this LED is doing right here. So, what I'm doing is I'm taking all the green LED wires out of the breadboard so I can move the, the base. So, and this little guy right here, that's it, is a flashing green, or excuse me, flashing white LED. I only have the flashing LEDs in white. I do not have them in any other color. I never really needed to order any. I, I ordered some white flashers for a, a project. I got like a pack of 50 and I only needed so but it is what it is and to make life easier instead of going with a whole source of circuitry that you know if you want to try this at home might take you forever or you may not have the technical ability or you just don't want to deal with the space you have this option so I've lowered the voltage so it doesn't blind the camera so this LED at full voltage is, you can see it's much brighter, which is four and a half volts. If I lower the voltage down to, let's say, two, uh, 2.7 is about as low as it'll go. You can see it's still, well, you can see it's still flashing. There. So, and then I took a piece of heat shrink, and I heat shrinked one end of it and pinched it off while it was still hot, so it makes a cap. So that way, you can cover this. So if you want to put this in your display, and you want to put it in the base, somewhere down here, um, you won't see this shining through the plastic. If your house is porcelain or resin, it probably won't shine through, because the resin is much thicker and the porcelain is much denser. But this being plastic, and it's a white plastic, as you can see, that's just painted, you will see this flashing through, so you need to cover it. Now, you can buy these in colors. 
I said, I just bought a package of white many years ago for a project. And maybe you just want to put, buy one of the green ones as an example. Put the one green one down here in the base and then just solder all the wires to it. And bam, there you go. All of them flash. And it doesn't have to be for this house specifically. Um, there's a couple of houses out there that come with flashing lights. They don't flash on their own, meaning like this one, they flash using circuitry. Sometimes circuitry is beneficial. Sometimes it's, um, well, it's overrated because it fails often. Uh, kind of like on this piece where the circuitry failed and everything quit working except for one motor. So, <clears throat> so here's an easy way to make your lights flash. And that's what I'm going to do for the green lights. So I'm going to take all these wires that are here. Basically how this worked is all the wires that are green, whether they're green, black, green, gray, or uh, dark green and gray, which I don't know why they are, or excuse me, green, white, and green, gray. They have two different color greens. Uh, they're mean green LEDs, at least on this piece. And then all the wires that are purple, like this, purple white, purple gray, purple black, those are the purple or UV lights. Most of those are in the top or in the shaft, the upright, here where my thumb is. Um, the base is pretty much all green. And then, of course, last but not least, that uh, top is all amber lights or yellow depending on how you want to call them to me it's an interchangeable term <clears throat> which is <clears throat> these right here all those these are all been replaced um i mentioned it in one of the previous videos i think it was a sneak peek one uh where they're all new lights and new wire and then I have a long extension to run down the center, which then will get cut and shortened to fit. And then there's the one that goes up inside the octopus, the actual head of the octopus. And I'll show you how these lights look. Same thing. I was going to make them flicker, but... Or it's not uh, pulse. But the problem I was having is the same thing. Because these are such a low forward voltage set up they kept blowing the leds and like i said i've never had this problem before i've tried several different chips several different leds same result so and i'll explain why the uv ones don't have that problem here in just a moment so Turn the lights off, and you see this in low light. And make life easier. We'll put the, the head back on just to stop with the flooding of the camera. Now you can see the hot spot on the skull, so this can be bent in the place when you assemble it, so that way it's not uh, pointing off to the side. You can also crack the LED which I might do, which diffuses it. Or you can put a diffuser on it. The hole is definitely big enough for a diffuser. But you can see how it works. These are orange. Actually, I think these are classified as the yellows. Yeah, these are the yellows. These are the yellow flicker lights. They're called flicker lights because if you look at them, they're twinkling. They're flickering. They're supposed to imitate fire. But in other circumstances, they kind of look like they're pulsating in patterns. You can see how they're flickering. Uh, this isn't quite the exact same as the OEM pulsating board, but it's close. And I don't have to worry about the LEDs burning out constantly. All the lights are coming back. So this is how we're going to make all the lights work. We're going to use three different circuits for three different colors. And when I say circuits, I guess I should say a one full size circuit for one color, flicker lights for another color, and flasher for the other color. We got three colors, green, yellow, purple. So let's get this top back out of the way. I 
So what I'm going to do for the, the flashing lights, which is all the green wires, is I'm going to take the flasher LED and just solder it in line. So I'm going to take all the greens, which are positives, and solder it to the negative of the flasher. The positive will then go to a resistor on the incoming power to lower the, the uh, amperage that's coming through. This is going to be a 12 volt unit, but not everything inside this unit can run at 12 volts. So, the this runs at about 7. With the other lights in the series, this LED only runs at 4 without the other lights in the series. You put 7 through, you burn it out. But you have to do what's called, you have to balance your load. So, in series, the load isn't just this LED, it's all the LEDs. <laughs> so, I need to make sure that's clarified. If this is by itself, it's about 4 volts. In series, with all these green LEDs on this base and this top and the center shaft, uh, I'm going to be running at about 7. 6.8 to be exact, within a variable tolerance. The lights that are on the octopus itself, those independently run about 3.3 3 is their average voltage um, for uh, the flicker, but I have to run them at about 5, a little over, about 5.2, uh, to get all of them to be bright enough to be seen. I can lower it to make it dimmer because the camera shows it really bright, but in, in actuality, they're not near as bright as the camera picks it up. That's the problem with lights. A lot of times cameras pick up the lights in a lot higher intensity than they actually are. So sometimes it's deceiving. Uh, if you watch some of the review channels where they review the villages, you can see when they change the light around the piece, like, uh, like the, the light here that's on, the piece gets really bright because the camera has to adjust. And sometimes cameras can't adjust LEDs because they're super intense, especially when they're pointing at the lens straight up, as in my case. So, but we use resistors to lower the powers. Now, being it's going to be 12 volts in, here's the 12 volts in. So I did put the switch in. So the power goes to the switch on off. Then the power and ground go to the board. This is the board that does the timing for the top. Here is the first circuit. I'm going to stick it between these two standoffs. I actually took a drill bit, which is right there, and ground a little U-notch, you can see, so that way I can fit it right here, and then I can put some glue on it, so that way it's pretty taut, it's out of the way. And we're going to build another one of these circuits and put it right here. This resistor right here is for the octopus on the top. So I already got my resistor set, so as soon as you give it power, we'll send power to this board, we're going to send power to this breadboard, and we're going to send power right to the lights on the top, and the same token, we're going to send power right to the green flashing lights. So when you first turn this on, the only delay you're going to have is the purple LEDs will have a delay, because it takes a second for this to turn on and for this capacitor over here to charge. That might be easier if I turn it this way so you can see it right there. Capacitor's not on instantly. There is a second, second and a half delay. And then this guy, when it turns on, it goes through a startup sequence, which takes about two seconds, maybe two and a half. So when you first give it power, it's not going to instantly just turn on everything and it's going to go. Your green and amber lights will turn on first, or green and yellow lights. Then your purple lights will turn on, and then your spinning motion will turn on. And it'll be quick, but it'll still be a delay that you'll probably notice, because if you have an original one that works like it's supposed to, you turn it on, it just starts doing its thing. This has to start up the circuitry, it has to turn on the chip, the chip has to do its self-check, the LED flashes on the board saying it's got power, verifies. Then it sends signal to the other chip, which controls this relay, and then does your timing. This power comes in, everything starts to energize, the capacitor has to get charged before it discharges, and then the chip starts doing its thing. So, if you change the capacitor to a different value, it speeds up or slows down the light pattern, which speeds up or slows down its initial turn on. But things that are just LEDs are instant on. There's no delay. So that's where we're at. So I'm going to move all this away. 
and we're going to build another one of these circuits on that little board and that way you can see how it works i built a whole bunch of them right here testing different leds and actually the chip on that little board was the one that went right here <laughs> it's not there anymore because i'm just taking them out of my baggie and i'll put a um a link when we're done uh, where you can get the chips and everything uh, these are any 555 chips now any 555 chips they've changed a couple of these are any 555s and some of these are the new 7555 chips same thing they run at the same forward voltage they do the exact same thing it's just one's old one's new because i have any 555 chips from the 90s as long as they don't get smashed or statically discharged violently they work forever it's a very very popular um chip it's a it's a timing chip it's a it pulses it's been used for a long, long time. And it's still used for projects. When you buy science kits for your kids, if it comes with a little chip, it's usually one of these, and it's like a clock or a counter, and that's what those are used for. But uh, I'll link to the transistors, the capacitor kit. I just bought a kit so because I didn't have the right value, which is weird. But So I bought the BoJack 630-piece capacitor kit. If I didn't have any, there we go, no glare. You can read the different values, different uh, voltages, so on and so forth. So we'll go over that with you too. Uh, resistors I had, which not a big deal, but I'll link some resistor kits below. There's two resistors in each one of these circuits. There's a, in this case, it's a tan one and a blue one. You see the blue and the tan. It's just two different manufacturers because the resistors come in blue or tan. It doesn't change its function. The bands on the resistors is what does its function, not the actual uh, color. Because you can see this resistor is brown, like brown with some bands on it. So the color doesn't matter. It's those bands that we're concerned about. That gives us our homage and our tolerance. So if you're not familiar with resistors, they resist the flow of current. So, an LED, like this one, can run up to 20 milliamps of current. Anything beyond that, it starts to get a little uh, burnout-ish, I guess we can say. It starts to get dim. And sometimes they explode, sometimes they just go out, sometimes they smoke. You know, just depends. So, if I have my voltmeter over here, or my uh, power supply, let me rephrase that, pumping in 12 volts of power, the milliamp draw is slow, but the push, the voltage push is too high, which will also destroy the LEDs and destroy all the components. So we use a resistor to resist that flow to slow it down, make it uh, more manageable. It's kind of like a gate on a water pipe. You close the gate, it reduces how much water comes through. And that's what we're using here. So this blue resistor, which I know is hard to see, I'll bring it up, that blue resistor, is you can see when it goes across is to the LED. That's so we're not sending full power to this LED. This resistor here is for the chip and this resistor is for the light. Capacitor is the timing, how fast and slow this pulsates. We got some just basic jumpers which just jump the pins. So this is the incoming power. I, I, to make it easier I painted this red and black. Uh, I know the wires are red and black but just so you know hot Negative. I just took a Sharpie before I started filming all this. Make it slightly easier to see on camera. So the hot's on the right. We need to put a hot jumper to the left, hence the jumper. And then we have a jumper from the negative to over here. Basically, we're just making jumpers across the chip or around the chip. doesn't matter. And then the transistor, which also helps with the opening and closing of the on-off, the switch, or the reducing of power going to the LED because it goes from here to the resistor to the light. So, so I'll go over how to build this. It's a very simple circuit. You can actually look it up on YouTube and the internet in general and find many different people making them in many different ways from breadboarding to solder together like this <laughs> where this works too. Um, it's just not as pretty. And let's say you want to, let's, let's say you build this circuit and you put it together and three years from now this capacitor leaks. Well now, you need to desolder it, put it back on with a new one. 
the more heat you apply towards the chip, the more likely you are to damage it, the soldering part. When you use a breadboard, let's say that capacitor fails, you just pull it out like that and pop a new one in. Just make sure because capacitors are generally polarized. You can see the negative, that's positive. So the shorter lead, which is hard to see on this one because I trimmed it, this would be the shorter lead, which would be negative, and this would be the hot. I trimmed it so when I put it in the board, it's straight up and down and not cocked at an angle for the difference in length. So, But we're going to take one of these circuits, we're going to put on that board, and show you how easy it is if you want to try it at home. And there's also, again, it's called a um, LED pulsating circuit or LED flashing circuit. And there's tons of videos from many different countries on how to build these. It's a basic circuit. It's one of the first circuits I learned when I did electronics back when I was in uh, high school, when I took electronics then. Uh, this circuit has been around for longer than I've been alive, basically. It's a very, very common timing circuit. And like I said, I use it on my, uh, my display. I have the trains. I took the drive gears out of them so they don't move back and run. And because I have it on a piece of track that's uh, know, three feet long, it's not an oval, and I have a tunnel. So I made the tunnels pulsate the light inside, and this is the circuit I used. Like I said, it's a very common circuit. But we're not going to do this way. I'm not going to solder them all together and make a little pile like this. I thought this would fit in here if I made a couple of them, it'd be great. Then I realized um, I sent this back to the person. They don't even live in the United States, and they get it in, let's say, like I said, a year or two from now, they're using it one day, and the capacitor fails. Now they have to desolder all this, where if I just put a little breadboard in here and put all the components on it, capacitor fails, pull it out, push it in, it's good to go. Most capacitors are going to fail if you've seen some other videos, especially the ones with the boats. Uh, either the bottoms blow out which is the most common on these, or the top bubbles, which is the way they're supposed to work. But on for some reason, these itty-bitty guys always blows the bottom out. Uh, one of them, this whole cap blew off and the inside unwound. It was very interesting. It's like it got way more voltage than it should have, and it basically grenaded inside the piece. But of all these components, I'm going to say the capacitor would be the first one to fail, and then followed by the transistor, and then probably the chip. Um, unless you super overpower it, the resistors are usually pretty good. Set that out of the way. All right, I'm gonna go turn on some more lights. We're gonna make a little room, and then we're gonna put another one of those uh, circuits on the breadboard over here, and we're gonna make sure it works. And then we get to start assembling. And I mentioned that I'm gonna have a really easy way to change the voltages. Uh, so I'll mention that real fast. 12 volts in, the driver board runs at 12 volts. It can run between 5 and 24, so 12 volts. This system here runs at 12 volts. There we go. Got two 12 volts. Good. 12 volts, good. But this LED here, which is the octopus, runs at 6, approximately. And then these LEDs here run at 6, approximately. And then the motors, we well, can't forget about those, that make this thing spin and go out. They run a five. And you're like, oh man, we got different voltages. You can't use resistors because they'll literally smoke. There's too much power, especially on the motors. Well, to get five volts, they make this really cool circuit that you probably use every single day, never pay attention to it. What in your life is 12 volts, let's say a car, 12 volts, and you need five volts. What do you need five volts for? I don't know, charging your cell phone. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, hey, wow. Look at that. 12 volts in, 5 volts out. And in the case of this one, it's 9 volts on the green for the rapid charger, 5 volts on the white. So, um, hey, now I have a new voltage source. I can take the 12 volts coming in, branch it off into one of these, and bam, I got my 5 volts to run the motors. This is what the inside looks like. <laughs> So, you can build a circuit to down or reduce the power. You can use a transformer, 
you can use um, a chip circuit like this or if you got an old one of these lying around that works or like you stepped on it and you broke the casing pull it apart look what's inside 12 volts on the bottom 5 volts on the top and this this is what was running the motor on the first video when I had these spinning it was coming off of a 5 volt USB cord um, matter of fact I think I still have the cord lying here I do it's right here here is what's running this motor on this so if you have an old USB let's say uh, this is a Apple rapid charger or a USB C or a micro and you broke the end off you're like oh it's crap this wire is useless I'm gonna throw it away don't throw it away because this end is good and usually inside there's only two wires red hot silver in this case not or ground so when I plug it into here and I plug this in the power whew, I got five volts so you can build a circuit you can go online look up how to do it you can go buy a transformer you can do whatever you want to do but I'm gonna tell you these things are cheap you know I can go to the dollar store and get one of these Oh, there's a dollar twenty-five store now for a dollar and a quarter as long as the amperage rating that's rated for is greater than your components the two motors together they're they're averaging about a eighth of an amp so this is a three amp charger I'm like that's way overpowered but it'll never burn out this is a half amp charger this is one of the old original before we had smartphones that drew tons of power before they came out with two amp and one and a half amp and three amp cell phone chargers this is old school and if you plug two in at the same time it would trip itself it was too too much power for a cell phone but if i plug two motors into this it worked just fine because this is still five times more powerful than what the motors draw so i like to go i try to go 50 percent over meaning if i'm pulling one amp i want a two amp power supply some people are like i oh, get away with a one and a half amp you can it just means you're going to get closer to that threshold of failure um, if i'm running two amps i'll put a three amp power supply in because they don't really make much much of these that are much stronger than 3.1 3.4 3.4s I've load tested. I have a load tester. Yeah, they really can't do to 3.4. They usually cut out around three. So, and they get hot. This doesn't get hot. I've already tested it. It just doesn't have a lot of juice, so I can't use this for cell phones. But I can use it to power a five volt motor and a hobby piece. So that's how we're going to start breaking up the powers. Now the LEDs that are in here, here. And on the octopus head, which is over there, uh, we're just going to use resistors. Hence the reason the one that's already soldered in to the unit. But for the motors, you can't really resist them. That resistor will get ungodly hot and then turn into magic blue smoke. So here you go. Simple, easy trick. This. And if you really want to, in here is a fuse. This one had a fuse too. It was pushed up against this piece of metal. You can put a fuse back in it if you really, really want to. You don't have to, because nothing in these units are fused. And if you build something like this and you want to put a fuse in it, you just put the fuse in up here and have everything come off the fuse. Um, maybe a two amp fuse, one and a half amp fuse. I don't know what this thing draws full, but it's just under an amp, just based on doing each piece individually. Once it's done, I'll put a power, my power supply when I plug it in will tell me how many amps this whole unit's drawing when we're completely finished, if you want to fuse something like this. So, very simple, doesn't take a lot to do it. All you gotta do is when you take it apart, make sure you do the negatives and positives appropriately. So, because if you look, you only see one thing here that's your positive and then your negative was we're gonna have to solder it back on 
It's right there. That blade. So you can solder to that ball right there, or you can put a, a female spade connector on it right here. And then this we can solder to the two tabs in the bottom or solder to this piece here, however you want to do it. But hot, negative, five volts out. So, all right, give me just a moment while I set up for the next step. And then we'll finish this and then we'll start assembling it in part three. So that way it's not a four hour long video set. So I shall return in just a moment. All right, we're back and cleared off the bench. And I put a piece of tape down since I'm looking at this small piece, I won't be able to see if I'm in frame or not since it's zoomed in. So the tapes will let me know approximately where I am on the actual screen. <clears throat> so now we're going to duplicate this circuit over here. So, uh, basically, this is a breadboard. Uh, just like this is a breadboard. Just you can see the size difference. This one has rails that go down the entire length to jump over power. This doesn't. These lines go across that way, or just like those. So it's just the intersection of a standard breadboard. <laughs> Which means you need to jump power to the next circuit, because there's no way to do it. So first thing we're going to do is we need to get the components. So we're going to need a chip, two resistors, capacitor, uh, uh, a transistor and some wire. There's some wires you see here. <clears throat> you might need tweezers or something to do this uh, if you don't have the dexterity, which I don't always do, to do this. So sometimes I use tweezers or needle nose pliers. So on a chip, see it. Uh, that's gonna not focus. Kind of see that dot right there and there's an indentation. If I bend my finger it kind of looks like a U. That's the top center of the chip. The dot is next to pin number one. So going from left to right, it, or left, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's one, that's eight. So it's a U. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's how this chip works. So I'm going to stick it in where it's one row above the bottom. Make sure that you have four in and four in because on one of the ones I built that wasn't working, this pin folded forward and was in the same hole as that, which kind of stops it from working. So I'll make sure it slides in all the way. Now, a lot of times these pins are splayed out, meaning that uh, if you were to push it in this row, but these pins would try and go in this row. So you sometimes have to squeeze these pins in so they fit into the board where you want. You cannot have them on one side because your separator is this piece in the middle. Because this is power, this is ground. So if I put this over here, um, there's no path for the electricity to flow. Now, next because I, I like to put it on the outside, which is the transistor right there. Here's the transistor. Now you do have to splay the leads out. You see I bent them out. This is a BC547. Um, and how this one works, is I tip it a little so I can see, you have, uh, I have it to where the, the uh, it's got a collector emitter and a base. The emitter is on the right, and I have it, if you notice, it's up here. You can see it right there. It's past the chip. So it goes from pin four for the outer. Ah, there we go. Pin two for the middle. 
And the outer one on the other side, or the right side from where I'm looking at, you see is past the chip, just like that one. And that's because that's the emitter that's going to go to the LED. It's actually going to go to the resistor first up there. So there we go. Make sure it's in all the way. We're good to go. Uh, next component I'm going to stick in is going to be that blue resistor. So here's one. I've already trimmed the wires. I didn't trim the wires in that one. But how that's going to go is it's going to clear the entire chip, meaning it's going to go from the row behind and the row in front. So we're going to do it here. Two. There. That. And that's because this resistor has nothing to do with the chip, meaning I don't need any of the pins of the chip for it to work. I need to get the power that comes off of the transistor and resist it down to the LEDs. So that's why I put the chips offset, so I can use a row in front and a row in back, still make it nice and tidy, meaning it doesn't take up a lot of space. Now, of course, these jumper wires are oversized. I could make them shorter, so they go over the top of the chip. It doesn't matter. Oversized is fine. I'm more concerned about the components being tidy than the jumper wires at the moment. Uh, next would be the capacitor. Now, trim the legs, and you can see the minus clearly. And that side doesn't say plus. But I am using a 100 microfarad, I don't know if you can read that or not with the light clear, 100 microfarad, 16 volt. You always want to make sure your voltage is higher than what you're doing it. 16 volts higher than 12. You can use a 20 or a 25 volt as well. The reason I'm not is they're slightly fatter and that means they take up more space on these breadboards. And this one the negative goes to pin 1, the positive goes to pin 2. That goes in right there. Okay. Pin 1 and pin 2. And then next, we need to do the other resistor and then the uh, jumpers. So the resistor is, this one is 33K, and the color code on it is orange, orange, orange. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. There you go. So resistors look like this when they come, where they have these long leads. You can kind of see. So it's trimmed, and then I folded it to make it tight, because this goes across pin 2 and pin 3. Now, it doesn't matter which side the resistor is on, it doesn't care. I have it on the left side, so it doesn't hit the capacitor, so I have more room. So, just like that. So I could turn it around, but as you can see, if I turn it around, it's going to push this guy over like that, and I don't want that. I want these things to be as straight as possible uh, to make it clean, tidy, and easier to fix if something fails. You can just pop it back out. So there are the basic components. Capacitor, two resistors, transistor, and a chip. Okay, let's see, it's not terribly difficult um, at the moment. Now we need to do the jumpers. So. I use solid core jumpers. These are ones that I made. There we go. <laughs> and if you buy uh, breadboard kits, they come with jumpers like this. They're solid core, they come in colors and different lengths, but here's an example of one. Um, the reason I'm not using the jumpers that came with the breadboard kits isn't because they're, you know, expensive or something. Um, they're, they're tin. See, a tin, copper. Copper flows electricity better. I want to make sure that this circuit works better. I understand that the components use tin leads or metal leads because a lot of them will stick to a magnet. But at least for the jumper part, where it jumps the power in the ground, I'll have a better connection using copper. And I try to use copper more when I can. Uh, this is, uh, I've mentioned it before, this is two-strand telephone wire that I got on a spool. I just trim. You can use whatever you want. 
I just do it as a personal preference. So I'm not telling you that using tin or aluminum is bad. I just do it for, um, I just prefer copper. It has a better conductivity rate. If you want to go really good, just get some gold. It's like the best, but it's too expensive. <laughs> so, all right, so we need to jump the power and the ground. So that's the next thing we're gonna do. Actually, it's not the power and ground, it's power and signal. So, where my needle nose? We need to jump pins three, I'm sorry, two and seven together. Now, pins two is going to be harder to get to because it's the one that's the capacitor is also plugged into, but we still have a blank spot right here by the resistor. So we're going to slide that guy in right there, and we're going to jump it around to pin seven. the longer one. It's too short. There we go. To pin seven. There we go. Much better. Just push those back in because when I did it I knocked them up. Oh, it's good. And now Pin four and pin eight need to be jumped. So pin four is the bottom left, right there, to the top right, which is right there. It doesn't have to be right against it. Like I said, the whole track is four neat. So there is your circuit. I use shorter wires so I don't have this big loop. I'm going to cut this resistor down so it's flush, not sticking up. So the only thing I really want sticking up would be the capacitor. As you can see, it's the tallest. Um, this jumper wire here is actually for the LED. So you know I have the resistor going from here to here. Um, let's see. It's... Uh, Trying to see if I can move it around so you can see it better. There you go. So I have the resistor going to here. So it's the one after and the one before. This is the ground for the LED. Because this right here is the negative and this is the positive. And I'm going to change these. I'm not going to leave them as green. This was just for me testing it on the small breadboard to make sure this breadboard wasn't effective like the last one. Um, the last one, the tracks were broke underneath, and I took the padding off to take a look. Um, it happens. Everything, quality control isn't the greatest, and plus these breadboards are old. Could have cracked just from being in the heat, because I got them from a garage sale where they were stored in an attic. And they shouldn't crack because they're metal, but, you know, things happen. So, um, this jumper isn't really necessary. This was just for me to test the LED. So this is just jumping the negative to an open track so I can have a path to go through. Because LED needs electricity. That needs to go through from positive to negative. So, uh, pull out so we can show you that both of them work. Here is an LED. So the longer lead, in camera, the longer lead is positive, the shorter lead is negative. So on this one, I would jump from there to there. There's my positive, which is the resistor, and the negative, which is this guy here. Turn on my power supply and upping the voltage to 12 volts. There we go, 12 volts around the money. So positive. 
positive goes to pin 8. And negative. So we know that one works. Now we need to test this one. So on this one, because I don't have as much at the bottom, and I want to do this on purposely, is because I'm going to be soldering this or attaching this inside the house. I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump the positive across to here, because this is still an open track on this side. Nothing's been attached to it. Now we need to have a jumper that goes from here to the negative. So I'm going to use another one of these green wires just as a tester. And this is going to go from the negative all the way over here. Like so I'll fold it out of the way. But I also need to send negative and positive to this side. So I'll try and jump it from here to here. Which means I need another wire or two. Positive. And I'll just jump the positive right here. I'll pull the wire down so it's out of the way. And I'll grab another wire. I just want the blue. I could have grabbed the green if you all wanted me to. Doesn't matter. And there's the negative. And I don't think I have any more negative spots, so. We're going to jump it right to here and share the negative off of the other chip. And if it's all correct, then both lights should now turn on. Now, if you notice from the time you heard the click to the time the light turns on, did you see that delay? That's the delay I'm talking about when you power up this circuit when it goes into the house over there, or the piece, is it's not going to turn on immediately because there's a delay. It has to charge the capacitor. See? So now we have two pulsating circuits. Very simple. The first time you do it, it may not be, and that's understandable. I mean, I, I started doing electronics when I was in elementary school on my own. And then I went to real school as I got older to learn more and more about it. And I decided I didn't want to do that as a career choice. And I just do it as a hobby. And I like low voltage electronics more than high voltage electronics. Although for my day job, I deal with electronics that will kill you. I know because I've stopped my heart on it before. Uh, it's bad stuff. So you got to be careful. This is 12 volts. This entire circuit right now is drawing 100 milliamps. That's negligible. And that's only when the lights are at peak brightness. This is a very low power circuit. And there's two of them together right now. It's two together that's drawing that much. When I only had one of them running, my meter machine couldn't even read the power consumption because it is such a low power circuit. Now, if we add more lights to the series, which we will when we put it in the house, it'll bump it up a little. It'll run between 100 to 150 milliamps, which is still negligible. It's enough to stop your heart if you stuck it right to your heart, sure, but it's not enough that you're going to feel it through your fingers. It's not going to electrocute you. It's not going to hurt you. You can lick your fingers and touch this. You might burn out the chip, but you're not going to get damaged. You're, you're physically, your skin's too high of a resistance level. So if it's, you're afraid of getting zapped, this is 12 volts. They also make this exact same circuit use different resistor values in 9 volts. This chip here can run between 9 and 12 volts. The reason I chose 12 volts is 12 volts is more of a universal voltage out there for DC. You go to the store, you look at your, if you still have them, but most people don't. Remember your old portable phones that you plugged into the wall and you put on your charger base and you could walk around your house, you know, pre-cell phone. If you read most of those, they said 12 volts DC. Uh, a lot of older computers, 12 volts DC. A lot of newer ones now are like 19, 24, 36, but the power supplies are 12 volts out. Uh, your car, 12 volts, universal supply. Remember, they used to be 6 volts way back when, 50s, 40s, 30s. I know, I have a car that was made when it was 6 volts. It's 12, it's not, it uh, was 6 volts, now it's 48 because it's electric. Um, it's a universal voltage. It's a very common voltage. Uh, most stereos, some of the older televisions, they're all 12 volts. The power you plug into the wall socket, and then there's a 
the transformer inside to drop it. So going with a 12 volt, it's easier than a nine volt. Because if I go 12 volts, like I said, I can use this to step down my power. Whereas if I go nine volts, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> so 12 volts being universal means I have more applications to branch off power. Also, I have enough push to where if I need to put a more load bearing system on it, like let's say I wanna put in 600 LEDs into this thing, the 12 volts are gonna handle it much better than the nine. Even uh, some of the companies out there like Limax have come to this where uh, most of their products are 4.5 volts. We all know this. But if you remember, some of the older pieces had 9 volt. You got 9 volt motors, you had 9 volt lights, they all had 6 volt, and a couple units were 12. But if you try and fix a 9 volt system, you can't get the parts for it anymore because 9 volt has become such an obsolete circuit that people don't supply 9 volt motors anymore. They're really, really, really hard to find. It's not a universal voltage unless it's something that runs on a nine volt battery. So 12 volts, you can get more power for bigger circuits. You can get more readily available circuits and then you can step down the power. If I put 12 volts directly to one of these LEDs, it's gonna burn out, I mean, within moments. Um, but with the proper resistors, capacitor, chip, it's great. Then I can branch this 12 volts off into the other components. Even this little circuit board, incoming, right there, 5 to 24 volts. Because 5 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, those are common voltages. So it's a, it's got a range and it's a little voltage regulator right here. That's what that is. And keeps it running at the power it needs to do its job. That's actually how a lot of things work today. So, but there we go. There is two fully functional pulsating circuits for the purple LEDs. I could technically run all of them on one, but I'm not going to. Uh, the reason I'm not going to is right now they're, they're, they're working perfectly together. So they're pulsating in and out at the same speed. When I put this in the unit, it's probably gonna pulse at two different speeds because I'm not gonna have these jumpers the way they are for the incoming power. I'm not gonna jump it off of the chip. I'm gonna jump it off of the incoming power, which should technically change this guy and this guy so they're not in sync. And just to test that theory, let's try it. So I'm gonna remove that, and I'm gonna put it over here to the ground wire, the incoming ground. So, I mean, it doesn't mean it's gonna do it, but it, technically, because I'm turning them on at the same time, it should be still in sync. Normally, the tolerances will push them out of sync. And that one's a hair faster. By maybe a tenth of a second. This one goes out first and turns on first, but it's hard to tell because it's so fast. But I can see it up close, and you might be able to see it in the camera. Um, so... But there's a chance they're going to run two different speeds. And the reason I want to do that is it helps break up the pattern if they do go out of sync. So it doesn't look like it's a preset pattern. It, to me, it, it'll make it more uh, chaotic, which sometimes looks better. But you can build one or two circuits and make it work. I'm going to leave it as two and put it in here. Um, I'm probably also going to... Um, I thought about it. I thought about taking the white LED and straddling it across the center section where there's nothing in there. But I'm probably just going to solder it in and then heat shrink it just so it's out of the way. So what I am afraid of is in shipping, this is going to get jarred. And now the chip isn't going to come out. The resistors won't come out, especially once I push that guy down, trim it, and push it all the way in. Uh, the transistor and maybe the other resistor and probably the capacitor can become jarred. So I'm also thinking about just putting some hot glue around the edges just to hold it in place, but not enough that it damages anything or causes a problem to where if it has to be repaired in the future. Because the person that's getting it back, I'm hoping will watch this and re reference it if something fails. I'll probably even send a spare part or two with it. So if something fails, a spare resistor, a spare capacitor, a spare transistor, a spare chip. The LEDs are built into the house. Sending a spare one's useless unless you can solder or 
remove it. Plus, they're readily available, and you don't have to worry about uh, locating something special. So, and I am going to now uh, zoom out and fix all this, meaning make this uh, lower and change that jumper wire. And we're going to start putting it into the house and getting everything back together. One last thing before we can to finish part two is a lot of people, I mentioned that I can't get the soundboard fixed. The soundboard part's bad and the, unless you buy a whole new unit, which they're not new anymore. They'd be used and they're expensive. Uh, people have been sending me links and I've also seen them online myself for different sound chips, MP3 players, MP4 or MP3, uh, I forgot the other format, uh, MIDI or something, which that one would be horrible, from different manufacturers. One manufacturer is in the UK, um, that they have a YouTube channel, uh, their shipping is, um, well, I understand it's international, but it's just too expensive. So there was one that was posted in one of the Lemax groups that's on Amazon, and I ordered it, and it said it's going to be here between sometime this week to next year. Well, they finally updated it yesterday, matter of fact, uh, from me filming today. Uh, it's going to be here this week uh, on Tuesday, which today today is Monday, but tomorrow will be Tuesday. So if it shows up before this is reassembled, I'm going to do some tests on the soundboard and see if we can make the soundboard fit in here and make it work. My concern with the soundboard is when you turn the power off, does the soundboard lose its memory? It says it doesn't, but it's supposed to run on battery pack. Sometimes battery packs will trickle a little bit of voltage in to maintain a memory. Then it'll have like a built-in capacitor rechargeable battery on the board. Then it'll maintain memory longer, kind of like how your, um, your alarm clock works with a 9 volt or some double A's in there. If you lose power, it doesn't forget the time. When the power comes back on, it's within a minute or two, whatever time it was. Um, I don't always trust them, but I'm going to test them. And if I can get this one to work... I will try and record the sound in the best quality I can from the Lee Max video of this unit and then we'll see if we can install them in here. And then that way we will have lights, sound, and animation. Lights, plus what's over there. Sound being the board we're getting and the animation which we already know works because you've already seen that in part one. If you watch part one, this whole setup doesn't have to be used specifically for this piece. You may be able to use this for uh, the ghost around or the roundup, an example. Let's say it doesn't lift anymore. The, the part of the circuitry that tells us the unit to go up, stop, down, stop, fails. You could use an H bridge to make that redo its thing uh, because the other one just spins in a circle. It doesn't care. As long as it's getting power, it's going to rotate, and meaning it's not shorted out, because that's the most common cause on those, is they fill with oil grease. So there are other applications for what we're building for this than just this piece. This piece just needs it all because this entire piece is bad, most likely because it was plugged into 12 volts instead of 4.5, and, and it fried everything. Um, so just because you see something and you're like oh that's all it's good for that's not true i do this all the time i don't look at something for what is intended for i look at something for what i can make it do and that's what i do when i buy products i don't buy products just for their intended purposes uh, case in point uh, one of the pre previous videos to this one was the happy halloween sign when i saw the sign i didn't say oh that's a really cool sign well i did actually <laughs> but i'm like it would look so much better if it lit up and it does. And I'm going to make it slightly better by uh, covering the gaps in the light. Um, I did darken them, but in there are, in, to the eye, it, it's, not, it's not that noticeable. But on the camera, it's just ungodly noticeable because cameras pick up light differently than your eye does. Um, so that's how I do things. I buy things for what I can turn them into, not what they were intended for in most cases. And I've been doing that my whole life. So everything I do is custom, and this is a custom, well, it's a standard circuit, but it's going to be used for a custom-made uh, house. Uh, that's why if you watch some of the other videos, I think one of them was like the Lee Max ice cream shop that uses a light bulb when I built a flashing circuit board that rotates the colors through. 
I don't like the factory lighting that comes in a lot of these pieces that are, well, especially if they're bulb lit. So I'll change them. I'm making my own. Or the addition to the uh, toy factory. I added lights to the dark spots I didn't like because it's dark. It's like the whole front of the building's lit and then one side's lit and the other side's dark. And like, you know, where I have a position, the one side that's dark is the side that faces out. It's like, that looks stupid. So I added a light, made the window light up. Now it's not so dark. So just because I'm using it on this piece, you don't have to do it just for this piece. You can do it for anything you want. Um, it's yours. Make it yours. You own it. I don't care what Lee Max says about modifying their products, especially here in the U.S. If it's yours, you bought it, you paid for it, you got it as a gift, um, do whatever you want to it. Uh, paint it, change the lighting, change the speeds. It's yours. Uh, and that's what I recommend on like the Ghost Around. The Ghost Around, the lifting motor is a high-speed motor. If you put in the slower speed motor, which I know some people hate, it lasts longer. The slower the speed, the higher the torque. The higher the speed, the less the torque. When you have a lot of rotating mass, you need to understand how torque and horsepower vary. And this has a lot of rotating mass, but it's light. Because when the arms swing out, they're not solid. Not like the Ghost Around and Roundup, where it's a big flat plastic disc with characters glued to it. This is just thin pieces of metal with balls, and it weighs a lot less. So, Anyway, I'm ranting about... Uh, some of their design issues and flaws and ways to make things work better or modifications. <laughs> it's not what we're here for. We're here for modifying a broken piece to a fully functional piece as best as we can to match OEM, but with a little flair to make it personal. So, All right, so we're going to pause it here for part two, and we're going to continue on part three, which will be assembly. And if that soundboard comes in, I will have a part four which would be integrating sound if possible. Whether it works or not, I'll still go over it. If it doesn't work, I'll explain the reasons why it didn't work. And if it does work, it'll be inside the base. There we go. All right. Thanks for watching. Until the next one. Okay. The lighting circuits are all in, except for the octopus itself, because it's going to be in the way of me getting the motors driven part done but I have the cap on that's a lot brighter than it appears in person but the green lights are flashing and you can see the purple fading in and out and then there's the two that are up here which might be really hard to see actually the one that's up here is reflecting right in this area so <clears throat> now Every time this circuit board resets for the uh, uh, every 10 seconds, uh, the white light resets as well. So see how it stops and it comes back on. Um, I'm going to try a smoothing capacitor to fix that problem, but it does it every 10 seconds or thereabouts. It's when this is doing its rotation. So. Because um, what it does is there's a slight spike in the amperage that's going back and forth. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, <clears throat> it's better than it was, even if it does have that pause right there. Uh, it's better than being a broken piece. Because it kind of looks like it's resetting going back around. I'm going to turn the light back on. Bam. Light. So we got... Incandescence, I'm sorry, incandescence. We got the LED patterns taken care of. So we have the white light for the greens, which is the flash. We have the two circuit boards for the four UV bulbs or UV LEDs there. And then there's two on the top. This is for the motor, which is going to be the next thing because I need to put in that five volt dropper. So that'll be probably in part three and probably the final part. Possibly a part four because <clears throat> look what showed up today. So I'm going to test this, see what I can do with it. And if I can get it to work in here, then this will have sound. Now, what I have noticed is this has its own off on switch. And then for it to play, you have to press this button because I already took it out of the package and I didn't record anything, but it has pre-recorded sounds on it, which 
for like birthday cards and stuff um because that's what it's for it even tells you on the inside like personal gifts school projects hobbies so on and so forth so it's got like happy birthday music and stuff like that that are pre-programmed on this chip in here um, it recharges with a usb to recharge the battery so i might have to keep the battery in this uh, only because if I take it out, this may not function on the 5 volts because it's designed to run on this little battery. I'm hoping to find out. That's the testing part. The speaker is an 8 ohm 0.5 watt. Same speaker that goes right here. So technically this can go right back into its original hole. But we are going to do some testing with this and see what we can do. So there's a chance this might be four parts. Um, and that's just so it's not five hours long or six hours long. Now, I've been working on this project uh, for this person for months intermittently and on this part probably a good 30 hours straight because I've gone through multiple iterations of the circuit. I fried a couple um, where I smoked the chips where the capacitors popped uh, due to wiring issues or bad LEDs. Um, it might be hard to tell in the camera, but this LED is a different color purple than this LED. And you can see it comes on quicker is because this is a new LED because it exploded and this is an old LED. And then on the top, we got new LEDs all around the rim. And then on the bottom, these are all the originals. Uh, this unit had probably 50% of his lighting was burned out or shorted out. <clears throat> and that's just the way it came to me. So, so for part two, the lighting, it's working. I do have to put a smoothing capacitor in here for the motors. And that's because the, uh, where, I don't know where I put it, I know I said it around here somewhere, but the USB that I had lying out, um, these are super noisy. And if I put it in the circuit, it's gonna screw this up dramatically and it'll screw up the lighting. It'll screw up the uh, sine wave for the lighting. So we're gonna have to put a smoothing capacitor in here anyway. I might have to run two. Uh, probably not, just one big one should suffice, but it's all those things we're going to test. Uh, nope. I was looking to see where I put that. I'm sure it's on the bench here. But anyhow, this is the basic conclusion of part two. You can see the lighting is working. <clears throat> so we now have lights, we have motion, we have timing, which is why this is clicking on and off, and you see a little red light come on every five seconds, and then stay on for five seconds. Uh, that's in, out, in, out, or left, right on the motor, counterclockwise, clockwise, so on and so forth. So, on the next part, we're going to be working on the motor, the step down, how to do it, then hopefully reassembling it to see how it works, hopefully, and then depending on how long that's going to take, we'll work on the sound, if we can make the sound work. Um, yeah, so this is a very intensive project. My solder apparently dripped inside and melted to the plastic. That's fine. I can chip it out. The unit, when we're done, will be not quite original, but close to it. I don't know the sound quality of recording on this soundboard, but we're going to find out. The sound that comes out of it's fine. Um, I mean, for a half watt speaker. Uh, <clears throat> you know what? Since you're here, you're watching. Let me show you this thing. So here's a little charging cable. Which, if that's the case, I'll just run it off of the step down for the motors. Just charge it internally. So when you plug power in there, it automatically charges. So it's got a volume switch which we're going to have to remote because you're going to have to take it apart to set the volume. If not, you have an off on switch, which we probably just leave in the on position. So let's turn it on. Then you have a select. Well, that's half volume. That's no volume. That's max. And that's loud as obnoxious, loud and obnoxious. Turn it up too loud. It's deafening. I don't know what it's like on the camera, probably bad. Sorry about that. But it is deafening in here. 
for us back to the beginning. So it has three, three program things on here. The problem is it'll keep going through them, meaning this it'll just repeat itself. Um, which means if you don't want sound, you literally have to turn the sound off like that. Kind of like you have to do with the wheel. You can click it off or click it where it's just on and you can't hear the volume because it's at the minimum volume level, which is below the audible sound for your ears. I haven't tried programming it. I haven't tried anything. Heck, I haven't even read the instructions, which are right here. They look pretty basic. There we go. So, two folded. But that will be coming up in the future. So, for those who have uh, brought it up and even tagged me in it on Facebook, I did buy one. It's the exact one from Facebook because I don't have to pay a gazillion dollars in shipping from another country. And it's loud. It uses the same size and wattage speaker that comes in this originally. So fitting it will be fine. Uh, it runs off of 5-volt charging. It runs off 3.7-volt lithium battery, which I can still glue in here, which means when the battery fails, you have to open it up and then replace the battery. Also, the only downside is if the battery explodes, it's going to burn. <laughs> So he's like, eh. pros and cons of everything in life. It's no different than your cell phone or your vape pen if you have one. Anything with a lithium battery. Heck, even your power drills. That's a lithium ion battery on my glue gun. This thing could explode. Um, we're rechargeable flashlights. So we're so used to them in life, we don't under realize or comprehend that they're little mini bombs. And they do have a lot of power pen built up inside of them. And they're very volatile if they, um, well, get damaged. So... But this is a nice short cord. It'll plug in nicely to something like this, where there's multiple parts or ports. And um, if we just remote the volume out the side, um, we can put the off on and just solder it directly to the power switch, which means if you turn the volume all the way down, it should act the same. That's why we're gonna do some testing. So a little sneak peek of this and we're going to test it and see if you can incorporate this into your village whether you're fixing the sound on a piece that lost sound or you just want to incorporate a different soundtrack a uh, repeating soundtrack maybe for you know lightning or spooky sounds a uh, wolf howl or a witch cackling or some soundtrack for halloween or christmas or fourth of july you can re-record on this so if you use this as an external piece that you just have hidden somewhere in your, your village, for every holiday or season or whatever iteration a village you're doing, you could technically record different sounds on this. I don't know how long you can record, if they get 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 3 seconds, I don't know, I haven't tested it yet, um, and I don't know how good the recording quality is, because I don't know where the microphone is. <clears throat> I mean, looking at it, I don't see a microphone. I am wondering if you have to do a, uh, um, well, yeah, multi-file recordable sound. So you have to transfer it from your computer, probably through the USB. So the USB acts as a charger and a data transfer. So, yeah, that's fine. But we're going to test it. So that's a sneak peek of what's coming up in a couple of videos. There are some other videos that are coming out in between all of this. So just stay tuned for, it'll be the last part on this series. Uh, that's because I got some parts in and I was able, or I couldn't get the parts, so I just finished the ones that were sitting. So I'm going back and forth, which is why the parts change here and there, uh, trying to get all of these done as fast as possible since the holidays are rapidly approaching. No matter which one you like, it's coming up fast. So thanks for watching. Till the next video, whatever it may be, this or another piece. We'll see you then.